So, uh, yesterday as well for the lovely, wonderful tour, energy tour, and a lovely, colourful dinner as well. Um, I, I think that this conference couldn't be more timely. Um, the reason is because it is exactly 15 years since the launch of the Millennium Development Goals. But not only that, it was in 2000, the year 2000 also, that DFID published a small, very small book, but in my view very relevant, it was on poverty. And it was also in 2000 that the white paper, the second, second white paper, was published. And after that, 2002, and, and, uh, and, and uh, it was the launch of Tibet, the global uh, village for energy policy and reef. And later on, quite later on, came the Sustainable Energy for All in 2011. And then we have this network, uh, which I think is, is quite relevant, the, the low carbon energy for development in that. So all in all, I realized that not by chance, every previous speaker related to time. Three years, also a different, and here I am also talking in a chronological way. And I think it's the word transition that really inspired us to think about that. Now, when I thought about this conference, I thought, well, I can think about challenges now, but if I don't think about what we learned, how can we think about challenges? And I'm not, and in this presentation, I'm not going to talk about what happened in 15 years. I'm just going to say a few words about what I think we learned, what are the challenges, what are the paradoxes, and then how we and my team um, try to address those problems and where we are now. Um, so, to start with energy access and development, what we learned, what we learned on energy access and poverty over the last half century. And when I realized that actually we're talking about 50 years, it's a long time, but we were there. We're talking since probably the 1960s, when, I mean, the, the first statistics about access to energy uh, was published in 1996, but it referred to the 1960s, as, and it was a World Bank publication. And then we learned that two billion people uh, worldwide had no access to electricity. Um, and this was, as I said, based on the 1960s uh, statistics. Then we also learned, and it was, I mean, this was all again in the 1970s and later on, that the need for energy is implicit in survival. It's impossible to survive with the, without access to electricity. Uh, food production, I mean, can, in many, many instances, cannot get the, the nourishment value unless it, it is cooked. Um, shelter and heating, all that needs access to electricity. Incidentally, the Millennium Development Goals, as Deepak said, really totally overlooked the need for electricity to achieve all those goals. Um, energy ladder, another aspect that we learned, and this is more economic, from the economic point of view, people have access to more modern energy, the more income they have. So we started to learn really that poverty and access to energy is related to income is related to poverty. Um, urban and rural energy. 
We learned that the problem really is in rural areas more than anywhere else in developing countries. However, what is where the rural area starts? There is the peri-urban area. We don't need to forget that the poor are also living in the slums. Um, so those are some core <coughs> lessons. Uh, the more we dealt with access to energy, I think we more learned about poverty <coughs> as well. And we learned that also access to energy can give rise to income, it can improve health, education, social life, personal security, something that was raised yesterday in the film. <coughs> um, Reduces, it, it is possible to reduce degradation of natural resources if modern um, technology is available. Um, it's possible to reduce the, the, the rate of death, women and children's death, due to indoors uh, air pollution. So people can be better equipped to face trade disadvantages due to market reforms, particularly in developing countries. They can be um, more um, equipped to, in, to face the increased vulnerability and the exposure to climate change. So we learned more and more over the time how energy access could assist she faced those problems and overcome some of them. The, the clear aspect of this energy access and poverty is that energy, um, or without access to energy, the poor is trapped in poverty. And by trap, I see that there is a cycle, a cycle whereby if people don't have access to heat, uh, to heat water, then there is more disease. If there is more disease, there is less capacity to work. If there is less capacity to work, then there is no income. If there is no income, then we come to the ladder to the energy ladder, people cannot have income to access more modern forms of electricity. So this is something that we started to learn more and more. Then it came, the adaptation climate change came also into this big picture. So the solution, the solution since the 1960s, and we go back now a little bit uh, in time, is expand energy electricity. And that happened. That happened, with expansion, that happened in the, since the 1960s. And until today, 2015, is the main challenge. And I would like to focus in this table into main um, columns and rows. See if I can with this. We see that since the 1970s, late 1960s, the main approach to provide energy to the poor people who were not, had not access to electricity had been the, the, the expansion of the grid, the large grid. And if we look at this, we say, well, after all, there was a real improvement, and there was an improvement. The improvement was the reduction in the number of people who had no access to electricity. Millions of people, for the first time, um, could see the light, so the light, because of grid expansion. And that happened in the 1970s and 1980s. Big uh, loans, World Bank investment. 
So we are here at this time. So if we look now at the very bottom uh, row, we can see the percentage of um, population without access to electricity since the 1970s. So we started by 77% of the world population had no electricity. And this is the real gap in lack of electricity. Urban, um, this is rural electrification, is there world electrification, rural electrification, urban. And we are focusing now on rural because it's where the largest gap is. So from 77%, our rural population without access, we achieved, we achieved uh, 32%, which is a large improvement. We are talking today that 32% have no access to electricity. But have you ever thought what means 32% is a very large number? 77 was large, but 32% is not small percentage. As we are talking of 1.2 billion, more than 1.2 billion uh, people. So we can learn from the statistics, but we don't, we want to be fooled, fooled by the statistics. Still, 32% is a large percentage. So we learned all that, but then suddenly in 2004, we also learned climate change. And we learned that CO2 emissions from developing countries really were over, higher than developed countries. So that brought an additional a problem to increasing access to electricity in developing countries. How can we? really want more electricity, more energy, when we know that that electricity is going to affect global warming. So there we are the paradoxes then. Paradox one, we know, we learned, energy is a crucial livelihood resource to improve livelihoods, energy is necessary. Yet, access, continue, access to energy continues to be a marginal policy issue. And I say continues to be an ac a marginal policy issue because the issues that are more relevant, important, and they appear in the policy agenda, national and international, is uh, market reforms and electrification, for example, um, energy security, energy efficiency. Energy access comes down normally in the list, one of the last issues. Um, when uh, regional integration if in, in many areas in developing countries, South America, uh, also in Africa, there is an idea of regional integration. <coughs> access is not a first item. Paradox two, less, developing, the less developed countries emit more CO2 than developed economies. We know, we learned that. However, as I said before, 32% of the population <coughs> has no energy access. So there is more to talk about that the paradox, but I'm just focusing on the, um, on the lack of access and the low energy consumption of those who do have access in rural areas. So those are things that we need to put today together at this stage uh, in 2015. So what is the challenge? I mean, this is one of the challenges. This is the challenge that I managed to think about in these days, but I'm sure that there are, many, there are many more. So we need to implement energy solutions that one improve livelihoods. That's very important. But then we
we also want a reduction of solutions that reduce CO2 globally, not only locally. Uh, and that is the role of uh, renewable energy. We know that renewable energy is clean and does not uh, contaminate the local environment. But now we are talking, talking also about a global problem. So that's the challenge. And then we ask, how do we find out and assess the impact? How do we find out that solutions really improve livelihoods and that solutions also uh, do not impact um, global warming and climate change? And that is the purpose of the work that myself and my team have been doing in the last years. We didn't ask all the questions uh, about 10 years ago, the same question that I asked today, because we were not aware of the problems of climate change then. Um, but we are aware today. So that's, that this is at this point is when I want to move you to the approach to livelihood that we have been working on. I, I, I think I will leave questions for the end of the energy. So we also learned lessons on energy access and decision making. Sorry, the, 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 I, I, I should introduce. But what I'm going to, to talk about is about a systematic approach to, um, to improve access or enhance the access to renewable energy and to any energy in reality that can have a, a positive impact on livelihoods. And this is a systematic approach because we use modeling here. To do this, we also had to learn before going into um, into modeling, we learned that in the past, and I'm talking about in the beginning of 2000 and before, any decision that had to do with energy access for the poor, or what it was called the pro-poor energy access, which still I don't understand that expression, um, try to not to get the direct contact with those who would be using the electricity, and in that case, neglected. Neglected was not aware of the importance of consulting, talking with the poor. This regarded the population needs. The main focus, because it was massive expansion of electricity, was on technology cost and output, which are very important. Um, there was always a, a, a balance between demand and supply, but only to maximize total output, not to maximize other aspects of livelihoods. And normally draw on quantitative sources. So that's what we learned, and we realized that that was not uh, enough. It was good, but not enough. And that is how this um, sure decision support system was created. That was the thought behind a support or a system that could support decision making, the decision making in choosing those solutions that look also at other aspects, at other aspects of livelihoods. So what is this sure decision support system? is a model or a tool which seeks to define optimal energy solutions to encourage sustainable livelihoods and reduce environmental impact. The application refers to communities which often suffer severe resource constraints, mostly for the poor not only in rural areas, but also urban, the experience with the tool is, has focused on rural, uh, but it's 
is also applicable to other uh, areas. So what is this Chua tool? It's a sort of package. It includes the conceptual framework, an operational system, data collection approach, a modeling the software, and also educational booklet. But I, I will go very quickly uh, over this, each component. The conceptual framework is based on a sustainable livelihood approach. And I'm very uh, thankful to, to Ben, who really introduced what is sustainable livelihoods, because I'm not going to talk much about that. A multi-criteria approach and an integrated system. Sustainable livelihoods is a, is a large framework. And this is the whole framework, social economic context, livelihood assets, transforming structure and processes, livelihood outcomes. What we did was to concentrate on one aspect, and was this, the livelihood aspect, the Pentagon, the Pentagon. And looking at that Pentagon, we could really use all the concepts of the sustainable <coughs> livelihoods approach, which says multiple sustainability, not only environmental sustainability, social, financial, I'm missing one, environmental sustainability. Um, people have not only needs, they only also have resources on which we can build up. Small resources, a lot of resources, but they have something. We don't need to look at the poor only as needy, needed people. There is robustness. The more uh, the population have, the more um, the more robust a community could be. This approach is particip participatory, <coughs> put the people at the center of the approach, is responsive, is participatory because it goes to the place and learns what is happening um, in, in, in particular places. The sustainable livelihoods looks at find resources or capitals in a population that are natural capital, land, water, forest. And this is important if we're thinking of renewable energy. Because only if there are natural resources available is that we can think of the technology. Physical capital, irrigation, roads, financial capital, is there any um, social capital important in communities, whether there are networks, whether there are relationships of trust, um, or human capital. Human capital is first to the level of education, skills, skills to work, the state of health, whether people are in good or bad health, for example. So that is the sustainable livelihoods, and I will go back to sustainable livelihoods and the technology together. As I said, this is a multi-criteria approach we use in this model because livelihoods and energy is not a simple pro problem. It's a problem that is multifaceted and has a number of numerous factors. So if we want to model, we need to have an approach, a way to get the human aspect, the social aspect, to nature and the technology aspects. And that is why we use, we use a multi-criteria model or approach. So then we come to the integrated approach. And this is where things come together. We use a sustainable livelihoods. Any form of technology, mostly Renewable, we want renewable, but we cannot exclude the grid, extension to the grid, if that is the best solution for a population and the cheapest and the cleaner, which is not normally. And then the multi, multi criteria compromise programming. So we put that together and we created the renewable, the sustainable rural energy of the SURE decision support system. 
this was created by the research project, which is still working, third, uh, third phase. This phase we have very little funding, but initially we were funded by DFID, the Fund for International Development. Also, we had funding from the Kolu Foundation, currently the, um, the Renew, Renew World Foundation, and as a consortium of a number of universities and uh, coordinated by Imperial College London. Now I move to the operational system. As I said, it is, is a multi-criteria approach. Now, what we do with this system is that we learn what is available, the baseline, then we assess the most satisfactory energy solutions, we integrate in the decision what people want and, um, and demand, and then we match the resources the demand and the priorities to the technology, rather than the other way around, technology, and then see what people say about the technology when it has been already implemented. So how the system thinks, here we have the capitals. We think that there is a idea, an ideal state of development, which is the blue pentagon, where all the resources, all the capital are fully developed. It's ideal because I have never really found any community, any population that has all the uh, resources fully developed. The yellow pentagon, which looks at all the capitals, is the real, the actual livelihoods with a particular energy solution, which can be fueled as a firewood or can be a diesel generator. This is how, uh, how much um, resources, how much developed a population <coughs> is. And the idea is that with the improvement or the addition of energy, particularly if it is renewable energy, these livelihoods can be improved significantly, and that is the green pentagon, which is larger than the yellow, smaller than the blue, the blue pentagon, but still the tendency is towards increasing. The model measures this difference, the gaps between those uh, lines, those pentagons, and that is how we made from something that is qualitative, also something that is quantitative. Uh, data collection, the data is, okay, data is primary, is from surveys, and um, surveys and guide to semi-structure interviews. So what I'm saying is that there is primary information that comes from uh, questionnaires, but also we have information which is technical. I don't have time to go uh, through the case studies, but what I want to, to, to show is one of the last, um, the last uh, uh, slides, and is that after we did a few case studies, and implemented it, we got to the point that we said, okay, sure, address the challenges to improve livelihoods. What happened with the reduction of CO2 emissions? And we added, raised recently, life cycle analysis as part of the approach. So we can now look, uh, we are doing that with solar energy what is the real impact of bringing solar technology to uh, communities. And the, uh, the, the impact is not just that we avoid emissions. That is already learned. We need to know something else. And the something else is that we not only have one type of solar, uh, panels. We have thin, thin film, we have organic, not only silicon. 
we, learn, we know that the three types of solar panels have a very similar impact on livelihoods. It improves livelihoods. But then when we look at the energy payback time of solar, or we look at the embedded energy, <coughs> or from where it comes, we learn that it's very different. The, cell, the solar cells it contaminate or, or generate CO2 or more or less according to the time of cell that is used. So we integrated that in the model and we learned that certain particular cells are more, um, more appropriate to be implemented because it has, um, it has a lesser impact on global warming. So that is the uh, the changes or the additions that we managed to do. And this is how the Sure DSS interface looks like. Uh, it's not very clear there. Then, as I said, there is a booklet with educational information. And I just wanted to show this particular um, uh, slide on your left hand side is is lighting on the street uh, to improve security and this is in the middle of the chamber with solar technology this is some of the service done by sure in china the conclusion are we taking stock with energy um, access now 15 years perhaps it's a good moment to do that a panel is uh, energy access a policy priority or still a byproduct of larger policies? Lar livelihoods and energy challenges. We know that technology alone is not sufficient. It is needed to look at technical and non-technical dimensions. Sure, DSS is a step in that direction. And just to end up, this was the location, or the previous location, of a diesel generator. So this bush says, I used to be a diesel generator here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judith. I think we learned a lot from seeing how your modern approach can, can uh, help us um, in thinking in our own projects. And um, let's, I mean, we don't want to, yeah. there is coffee available, but let's have a couple of questions, Dave. Yeah, no, thanks very much. I really enjoyed hearing about that model. But I was wondering, and it's a bit of a critical question, but it's, it's one that I'd level equally at my own research as I would that potentially at this response to the question. But there seems to be a bit of a stark difference between your presentation and Deepak. When you started off talking about change and time and, and how things have changed and how tools like this can be something that we can use within change, but then Deepak's presentation about the realities of change in Nepal seemed to speak very loudly about politics, whereas politics seemed to be missing from this explanation of how we affect change. And as I said, I'd level it equally at so my own work on was transferred to quite recently. I just wondered if you had any kind of reflections on the political context within which any of the applications have been made. Yes, this is this has been the question from the beginning of this project. Who is this uh, approach, this model, uh, for? The the answer is for decision makers, and this is something I didn't stress too much. The idea is that different levels of decision makers would use it. The experience so far is in two uh, Latin American countries. And if one is Cuba and the other one is Colombia, which are currently uh, using. One is the national, national government adopted this approach as a pre-feasibility uh, work. And, and in Colombia, it was used by the distributor of energy, public distributor uh, of energy. So that is the purpose, that 
it would be used by <coughs> because there is a political thinking behind this. The political thinking is improving livelihoods, equity, and environmental protection. So the idea is that the teams that are working in different countries go together with the model to the decision makers. That is, yeah. Another question? So I think I have a follow-up question. So now my name is Diana, I work for UCL. And I've been researching with Vanessa Castan both about the energy landscape and I'm mixing again both um, presentations. I think it's very interesting that you speak about the need to put uh, access into policy. Uh, but the research we did in Mozambique, what it shows is that all the policies are focused on electricity. That is a bit of the beginning of your presentation. But what you see in the informal settlements is what they use is coal. So, I mean, for the basics, for, for, for eating, basically. They do have access to electricity, but the way they use it and the way the sort of energy ladder works is, is not straightforward. They are basically using a multiple sources of energy. Um, so my question is, I, I think there is a gap between whatever people really uses and feels, and I think was part of the first presentation. How is that they sort of understand energy, and how is that they use it, and what resources they use to, to access it. And this idea of we just need to provide electricity and it will be sorted. And that's what the policy says. So I think, again, this connects with your question of well, we are missing a, a political yeah. link there. So, so even for policy makers, I think that the gap still remains. The questionnaire, the, I mean, this tool works with the information gathered in a quest from the questionnaire. The questionnaire asks those questions. Ask what is the the need for electricity? What the electricity for? What are the priorities? Do you, for example, do you want to use your local waterfall to have a micro hydro? People may not want. That has to be taken into account. And there are other questions that refer to human capital and the social capital that are asked in the questionnaire and are accounted for when the model uh, is run. That doesn't mean that all the considerations are there. I think and this is a dynamic <coughs> model. We are trying to improve it all the time. So yes, I am totally uh, in agreement to what you say, because that is the difficult part, is how you integrate what the, the, the policy or the views of those who have not really been consulted for into the decision making process yet. That is brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. And I think <laughs> I'm going to now channel, I'm going to say. I'm going to channel the energy and all the questions that people have now and are opposed to put that we have coffee and we come back and we do these work we do these tables at the back, okay? So I've organised them. It's going to be households and energy, governance and energy, enterprise and energy, ecology and energy, education and energy, city regions and energy, Simon and others, um, transitions and energy. And I want you all to put your questions in around the tables, and then rather than three times, you've got time to switch over once. So go to two of the tables, and then we're going to have a feedback. And I think this, we've been set up brilliantly from the two um, keynotes to channel our energies now into sitting around the tables, switching over once, and then we'll be back. Ten minutes for coffee right now.